Welcome to the Cartoonist Kayfabe Courtroom. My name is Ed Piscor. I am Jim Rugg. Esquire. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to be continuing our Marv Wolfman testimony from his case in 1999 regarding the ownership of characters like Blade, Deacon Frost, I guess this Janus character and a couple other random jobbers. Nova, maybe. Yeah. Not much Nova stuff, but yeah, yeah. Uh, before we do that, I want to invite you guys to like, follow, and subscribe to the YouTube channel. Uh, hit the bell icon to mitigate the kayfabe effect, which is what happens whenever we talk about a book that seems interesting to you. If you're notified when we send the video out and you have first dibs, you'll get it at the cheapest price on eBay and Amazon, places like that. If you happen upon our videos later in the day without that subscribe button, that price pumps up on eBay. We heard uh, something went from $6 to $99 <laughs> by 6 p.m. You don't want that. Uh, subscribe to the channel. And also, if you play these videos to the end, that uh, helps YouTube know that the video is good content, ships it off to other uh, YouTube love and comic book fans who don't necessarily uh, check out all the cartoonist kayfabe stuff, helps us grow the channel, and helps make it possible to keep providing uh, videos day after day. And uh, what we're doing here, we have a whole playlist of, of uh, courtroom dramas uh, from Neil Gaiman testimony, Todd McFarlane tes uh, depositions regarding the Angela case, Harlan Ellison shows up in our testimonies. Uh, Stan Lee. John Byrne. We, we have, we found a, f a fount, a font of uh, riches. Yes, of comics, comics history that is mostly new to me. So. Yes, and, and told under, you know, with threat of perjury. Presumably this is the truth. Yes, or as they say, as the Gen, Gen Z calls it, their truth. Whatever the case may be, some of the best comic interviews I've read. Yes, we have uh, several other parts of this Marv Wolfman testimony uh, directly below this video in the description. You can hit, hit the links to check out the earlier parts. Uh, the cool thing about this stuff is that there are always these logical conclusions uh, for each episode because guess what? Everybody's bound by the human condition and essentially they got to take a pee while they're up there <laughs> on the stand and it's usually a good place to break with our videos. Now, the way that we're doing it is uh, we're using Comics Journal, issue number 236. You can play along at home. With the Faust <laughs> soundtrack to the movie and as an ad in the front there. Uh, but Jimmy is reading the voice. I'm going to need that afterward. Jimmy's reading the, the voice of everybody who is not Marv Wolfman. And I'm playing Marv Wolfman for these sessions. And where we left off was the final bits of uh, testimony with, I guess, Wolfman's own attorney. That's right. And now we're in the process of initiating cross-examination, so stuff should be getting spicy. Yeah, definitely. That that first testimony, you know, we, we say at the end, it pretty com seems pretty compelling that Wolfman created these characters and copyrighted them, and what's up? How does this not work out? So uh, I think we're going to find... We're going to start to hear the other side of this story. Yes. If you're ready, I'm ready, Jimmy. I am. Begin with Fleischer. Mr. Wolfman, what was the first story you were hired to write for a Marvel Comics publication? When I was hired to write for, well, the very first story I wrote at Marvel was, I think, Tower of Shadows. I could be wrong. If I suggested that the title was Tower of Suspense, would that ref refresh your recollection? No, I think it was Tower of Shadows. We're not off to a good start yet, Jimmy. <laughs> We're getting contentious off the bat. Do you, do you know when you wrote that story for Towers of Shadows? As I said earlier, I think it may have been 1970. It could have been 69. I couldn't tell you exactly when I wrote that. Roy Thomas hired you to write that story? He asked me to, yes. Is there a difference between him asking you to write it and hiring you to write it? I'm not sure if hire gives a sense that I think it's like an employee gets hired. There's a difference there. I was just a freelance writer. At the time you were asked to write that story, did you discuss with Mr. Thomas or any other representative of Marvel any aspect of who would own the rights to that story? No, the rights issues never came up. Marvel, Marvel never once brought up anything with rights. And I take it you never brought it up with Marvel. Is that correct? Didn't need to. I... So is it your testimony that throughout your tenure as a freelancer for Marvel, that is a writer slash editor for Marvel during the 1970s, there was never a discussion between you and any official of Marvel with respect to the rights to materials that you had submitted and were published in Marvel? That's a very long question. What part of the 1970s are you talking about? Any part. Certainly after, I guess, 1978. 
when they started to do work for hire, uh, they claimed ownership of that material. They never once. I didn't ask you what they claimed. I'm asking if you had a discussion with any official of Marvel concerning the ownership of property or material that you wrote for Marvel, and that was published for Marvel. Well, let me rephrase exactly what I was saying so that it answers your question. As far as I remember, the only time the rights issue was ever discussed was in after 1978 or as we're nearing 78. With whom did you have a discussion in 1978? I don't recall having one. I remember the work for hire material that was given out at that point. I was under contract, uh, so it didn't really concern me, but I certainly knew that Marvel at that point was talking about it. Mr. Wolfman, let me take it very slowly. Okay, please. Did you ever have a discussion with any Marvel official about the rights to any materials that you submitted for publication to Marvel? You're asking me over an incredibly long period of time. If you want to break it down to when I started, no, not ever, not once. You're talking about by the time I ended? Yes, I had known about it. Uh, whether there was a discussion, I don't remember. So sitting here today, you have in mind no discussion with an official of Marvel about the subject of who would own rights to materials that you wrote and that were published for Marvel. Is that correct? I just answered that. Is it correct that you have no recollection of ever discussing it with any particular official of Marvel? As I said, in the... <clears throat> in the early days and the middle days, right to the end, I know I didn't. Near the end, since I knew about it, I may have at that point, but that was again after work for hire. I don't want to say absolutely, but that would be the probably the only time that I have had a discussion with them because they never really brought it up beforehand. Am I correct that you are leaving open the possibility that you had a conversation, but that you just can't recall? I'm sorry, I don't think I stated that I don't recall having one, so I guess yes, I am leaving open the fact that I said I don't recall because I said it. Let me see if I can refresh your recollection from some deposition testimony that you gave. Do you recall giving the following answers to the following questions? Question, this is on page 65. <clears throat> Did the story you wrote for Tower of Shadows have any characters in it, any people? Answer, yes it had people. Marvel, like Skywald, like Warren, like Blast, like Web of Horror, did not ask to buy rights. I didn't have to sell them any rights. Nobody ever brought up at Marvel that they were buying it. If they did, I would have only used their characters. I would not have even put in a person. They were not buying rights, and I was only selling the rights to print my story, not to any characters that I created for them at Marvel. Question. Did you ever have a discussion with Mr. Thomas on the subject? Answer, no. Question, did you ever have a discussion with anyone else at Marvel about the ownership of the copyright and any of the work that you did while you were there? Answer, no. The only place that ever discussed that with me was DC Comics. Yes. So the answer to now, do you recall now that you did not have a conversation with anyone at Marvel about rights? Dilberto, can I just object to him shouting at the witness? I think that's uncalled for. Court overruled. Can you ask it again without shouting? I should have read that louder. <laughs> Who knew, man? There should have been some parentheses. Do you now recall that you never had a conversation with anyone at Marvel about the rights and the work that you did for Marvel? We were talking in that deposition. Excuse me. Don't, inter don't interrupt me, please. We were talking in that deposition about my beginning at Marvel. At that point, nobody talked to me at Marvel. So when I said, did you ever have a discussion with anyone else at Marvel about the ownership of the copyright and any of the work that you did at Marvel... You interpreted that to mean Tower of Shadows questions? I took that to interpret as the early work I was doing there and the work we had just been talking about, which is all the early work. Now, you mentioned that you understood your agreement with Marvel had to do with first publication rights. They were allowed to print my material. They were allowed to publish my stories, yes. And what was the agreement about reprint rights? As I said, they can publish my stories. I don't know if I brought things out separately, at this point, I don't recall. If you never had a discussion with anyone at Marvel about rights, how is it that you can testify that you had an agreement for first publication or reprint rights? My understanding of the law at the time was that you had to physically sell your work if, if you were going to turn rights over. Otherwise, you maintain your work. You maintain the characters and the stories. Do you have an understanding based on any agreement with Marvel with respect to the rights in your work? I said that my understanding was that with the absence of either signing a document or agreeing verbally, I maintained my rights. 
Did anyone at Marvel ever agree with you on that? I didn't ask them whether they agreed. They never asked me to buy my stuff. So you never asked them whether they agreed. You just assumed it. They never asked me to sell them the rights. Did Marvel ever tell you that they were fil filing copyright registrations on your behalf? They never told me they were filing copyright registrations on anyone's behalf. So is the answer to my question no? Yes. Did you ever ask Marvel whether it was filing copyright registrations in your name? Didn't need to. Is the answer to my question no? The answer to your question, I guess, is didn't need to. Prior to 1998, did you ever file a complaint against Marvel or any other person alleging the infringement of any rights in any of the materials that Marvel published? When you say, quote, file a complaint, end quote, are you talking about taking a lawsuit or are you talking about verbally or in writing complaining? Let's take them one at a time. In a lawsuit? No. I shall answer the second part? No. No. Shall I answer the second part? What written complaint did you make to Marvel? When they published the Nova comic, and I don't recall the year, it's not the current version of Nova, I sent a letter, as I said earlier, to, it was either the writer or the editor, because the writer was also an editor at the company at that time, so I don't remember which one I sent it to, saying that, hey guys, uh, the creator is still around, I should be writing the book, end quote. That was, uh, I guess, my gentle way of trying to say things to them. In your gentle way, did you say anything else in that letter? Whoever wrote the letter column wrote a lot of very, very nice things about me and the work I had done. So I thanked them for that and then said, by the way, and went into my point. So your point was that you should have been writing the new Nova column, the new Nova story. That it should not have been done without me, yes. I didn't hear anything about any complaint about ownership of rights in your letter, so I'm going to assume that your letter didn't say anything about ownership of rights. Is that correct? You didn't hear it because I did not say you cannot publish this thing. I said I should have. it should have been done by me. You don't go in with guns blazing. So you were aware of it being published, and you did not say that they should stop publishing it. You just said you should be the one to write it. Is that correct? I should be the one. It's my character. It was my character in 1968 also, or 67. During the 1970s, did you ever discuss Marvel's practice concerning work for hire with any writers or artists? After work for hire? Certainly. So when do you recall discussing work for hire for the first time? I don't recall specifics, uh, but we were all discussing it at that time, uh, period. When, in 1978, after the work for hire act came in, and prior to 1978 or thereabouts, when the 76 Act became effective, is it your testimony that you never discussed the concept of work for hire with any writers or artists at Marvel? I don't recall that. Do you know Mr. Byrne? Yes, I do. He's the one grinning over there. And how did you become acquainted with Mr. Byrne? He submitted a Fantastic Four story to me when I was editor-in-chief. You're certain of that? No. I may have met him at a convention. I have no idea. But that's the first time I was aware of knowing him personally. Are you certain that you were the editor-in-chief when Mr. Burns submitted a spec piece for Fantastic Four? I can't imagine having uh, turned down something unless I was. But if you ask me the date, I couldn't tell you because my memory of John was not great. Uh, but I don't know how I would have been turning down his work. It could have been later. It could have been when I was not an editor-in-chief. But I certainly had met him when he submitted that. I think that's the first time I met him. Didn't you testify on direct that you were the editor-in-chief and that you rejected Mr. Burns' work? You're asking me, could it be any other time? And I'm saying, especially since he's sitting there grinning about that and laughing, <laughs> uh, that it could be something else. I'm going, was it another date? I, didn't, I, I don't see how I could have rejected it. There were only two times that I could have rejected it. One was... Uh, the editor-in-chief, and one was I was editing Fantastic Four. So that's the best I can tell you. Did you ever tell Mr. Byrne that you understood Marvel to own everything that you had ever submitted to the company? No. Now, you testified on direct that you became aware of the Japanese film that we saw a few scenes from at or about the time that it was first released in the early 1980s. Is that correct? Yes. And did you ever make any kind of written complaint or threat with regard to an infringement of your rights with respect to that film? I'm not a very threatening person. Is the answer to my question no? Excuse me, please. Don't yell at me. Is the answer to my question no, Mr. Wolfman? <laughs> You're interrupting my answer. I will be glad to finish my answer if you let me. You also tend to do this in the depots. Let me finish. 
My question called for a yes or no answer, Mr. Wolfman. Mm -hmm. You may want it to. Did you or did you not make any kind of written complaint to anyone with respect to the Japanese film? Dilberto. Objection, no relevance. I made a verbal complaint to Mr. Shooter. So is the answer to my question about whether you made a written complaint, no? I made a verbal complaint. Therefore, the answer, I guess, would be no. And did you ever, in your discussion with Mr. Shooter, ever suggest that your complaint was other than an absence of credit or absence of courtesy in being notified that the film had been licensed? No. Did you ever tell Mr. Shooter that the film infringed rights you had in any of the Tomb of Dracula material? I told him that they took my stories and characters, and I wanted to find out if it existed. I was not threatening Mr. Shooter. He was not the person who would have made the, the decision to do this. I was asking him for the help to find out if this thing existed. Uh, he went to whoever he thought would have the information. He reported to me it did not exist. He certainly, probably, did not make that up himself. Uh, he was told that. And when I brought the videotape in, he had to go back to, I guess, the same people, maybe different people, and find out. Okay, the court. I need to interrupt now. I'm going to stop for the day. A couple of things. One, in case you're unfamiliar, the practice in our legal community is when your witness is on cross, you can't talk to the witness about the substance of his testimony, which means that you get to watch some basketball tonight or whatever you prefer to watch, and I guess you're happy. You're probably not happy having to pay a lawyer and not talk to him, but that's the result of that. So that means that you can talk to your client about the case, you just can't talk to your client about his testimony, and so that's where we are. Such bollocks. Like, like how, how are we going to account for that in real life? Right? Yeah, it seems, uh, it seems, you know, like sometimes you'll hear something like it's really hard to prove this or that kind of a, a case. Uh, it feels like you're allowed to talk to the client about the case, but not about his testimony. That seems like a very gray area. Uh, how easy is it to, uh, the, the lawyers in the crowd, how easy is it to distinguish between those two things yeah. has anybody ever actually been convicted of this <laughs> right yeah it seems like you'd have to really do something egregious for that to be um i don't know followed up on in our earliest testimonies with like neil gaiman or, or todd mcfarlane uh there were questions about that we, we broke yesterday like did you talk about the stuff so so they were getting into that and you and i talked about that a little bit some and some people in the in the uh, audience chimed in and, and described that you can't you can't massage a dude's neck, man, and 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 and, and coach him. And, and isn't talking about the case like isn't there like confidentiality? Right. So like, how would somebody even know the nature of whatever conversation? I, the only way I can see you could enforce that is there's no contact. Right. You're gonna go left out the door, and he's gonna go right, and you'll see each other tomorrow morning when you both come back in. Which doesn't feel smart. Yeah, and which I don't think is actually the case. What and I'm saying is, it seems impossible. Yeah, it's such bollocks. Hmm. A lot of honor system, it seems, in this game. I'm very curious what kind of comments come back from our, a lot from of our lawyer crowd. A lot of expensive <laughs> honor system stuff. Cartoonist Kayfabe is brought to you by the comic books that we make. Red Room Trigger Warnings, issue number one is on the stands today. In the first week of April comes Red Room Trigger Warnings, issue number two. That's the pumpkins issue of Red Room. And of course, last year... Uh, saw Red Room, the anti-social network, the idea for Red Room. It's murder on the dark web for fun and profit. Every issue is completely self-contained, and it is a gory splat fest, to say the least. Uh, the rest of the, the Ed Piscor bib bibliography that is currently in print, you have three volumes of oversized X-Men Grand Design retelling the entire story of the X-Men saga up through the origins to Days of Future Past. Four volumes of Hip Hop Family Tree documenting in a very linear fashion the history of hip hop and rap music. And WYSIWYG, Portrait of a Serial Hacker, charting the life of a computer hacker from the earliest days of high technology up to uh, WikiLeaks. Out in stores now, Jim Ruggs, Hulk, Grand Design, Monster, Issue 1, the 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 first half of uh, the the. Incredible Hulk lore out on the stands as we speak. Various flavors. The Peach Momoko is coming out soon. How's that work, Jim? April 14th. It'll be in stores everywhere. April 16th. 40, <laughs> 40 pages in issue documenting the history of the Incredible Hulk. 
there is a banger on every single page. Get it while it's hot. This thing is not going to be in the stores for long. And uh, before you know it, comes Hulk Grand Design uh, Madness with uh, some very cool variant covers uh, by Ed McGinnis and Jeff Darrow to kind of goose those uh, bookshelves in your local comic shops. And the rest of the Jim Rugg bibliography in stores now. Plain Janes with Cecil Castellucci and uh, rapidly going out of print soon. If you see it in your comic shops, get your hands on it right away, man, because we don't know when this is going to be back in print. Street Angel, Deadliest Girl Alive. Get these numbers up high on those Amazon charts. We love seeing it. We thank you so much. We appreciate your patronage. And now that we're done paying the bills, let's get back to the video. All right, man. Are you ready to uh, keep going? Cross-examination continued. All right. Diliberto. If I may, I just want to comment. During the day yesterday, the expert witness for New Line and the employee of Marvel were making faces and gestures at the witness all day. I would ask they be excluded from the courtroom until they testify or at least admonished not to make faces at the witness. Court. Sounds like we know what the conversation with Diliberto was over, uh, over pizza that night. The and John Burns making fun of me? <laughs> <laughs> but here's the court. I'm not going to do that. All right. Ooh. So back to Fleischer. Man, that's that seems harsh. The the, the, the are we reading that the court maybe is uh, a little feisty? The, yeah. Did Wolfman's side do something that rubbed them wrong? All right. So we're back to Fleischer now. Mr. Wolfman. Yesterday when we left off, we were talking about the Japanese film. And you, I believe, testified at the end of the day that at some point during the course of your discussion with Mr. Shooter about the film, learned that, in fact, Marvel had licensed a Japanese company to make the Tomb of Dracula film. Do you recall that? What I believe I said was that Mr. Shooter told me that, indeed, they had made the film, that it had been done. Maybe I said license, I don't remember, but it had been done, and that Marvel knew about it, and this was after they told me it did not exist, and they wouldn't admit it until I held a videotape up which had the film on it. So this was, I guess, evidence that forced him into telling me the truth. So I guess the answer to my question to you is yes. Uh, that I said that they had the agreement. There came a time that you learned that Marvel had given someone else permission to use the Tomb of Dracula stories to make a film in Japan. Is that correct? Yes, that's what I said. And after you had that information, did you make any written complaint to anyone at Marvel about the use of that Tomb of Dracula story? As I said yesterday, the answer is yes or no, Mr. Wolfman. Mr. Fleischer. Let's just stop here. No. Dilberto. Objection, arguing with the witness. Court overruled. Fleischer. Let's have a deal. I'm going to try to ask a yes or no question. And I will answer it with the truth. If you can't answer it with a yes or no, you will tell me, all right? No. I don't want a speech. Now the question is, did you write a written complaint to anyone at Marvel about the use of the Tomb of Dracula story in Japan? As I said yesterday, I complained to Mr. Shooter. Do you understand that to be a yes or no question? Mr. F Mr. Fleischer, at the depot in New York, my attorney was speaking with Mr. Palmer, asking him to please do a yes or no question, at which yes or no answers, uh, at which point Ms. Clinic uh, said, uh, Tom, take your time, answer the way you want. I'm answering the way I want, as per your person's instructions. All right, I got to interject here because we got a Tom Palmer sighting. Yes. This is Tom Palmer Sr., not Palmer's picks from Wizard Magazine, but the uh, the great Neil Adams inker, uh, the great Gene Colan inker. Uh, interesting that you've got an inker on the stand for this case. Got like, the whole assembly line, man. Where's Glennis Ween? <laughs> Where's Ralph Macchio? Who lettered this? Ralph this Macchio's was. in the back with the, doing a crane <laughs> kick, about to kick a lawyer in the jibs. That seems like a deep cut for testimony on on the uh, the creator and, and ownership for this this story. They're milking a hundred dollars an hour. Wow. All right, going back in. This is Fleischer. Mr. Wolfman, would you answer my question, yes or no? Did you write a complaint to anyone at Marvel about the Tomb of Dracula story used in Japan? As I said yesterday, I told Mr. Shooter verbally. I'll take that as a no. You can take it as I, as I told Mr. Shooter, as I said yesterday. Uh, I complained to Mr. Shooter yesterday verbally. Is your complaint to Mr. Shooter verbally was simply you did not get credit? Is that correct? No. I told Mr. Shooter they had no right to do my story. Nobody had come to me about my story or characters. 
Did you suggest to Mr. Shooter that you were going to file a complaint for infringement of your rights? Mr. Shooter was an editor-in-chief. He wasn't a business person. He wasn't a lawyer, so no. I would not have to deal with Mr. Shooter on that level. Leaving aside what you would have to do or not have to do, did you tell Mr. Shooter you were going to take the matter further in making a verbal complaint about the use of your characters? I also didn't tell the photo staff persons or assistant editors. No, I did not speak to him. It wasn't his business to speak to him about that. So I will take it as a no. You did not tell Mr. Shooter that you were going to take it further. Is that correct? I didn't say anything to Mr. Shooter outside of, quote, they had no right to do this, end quote. He came down and said that there was no money made. Uh, I could not expect to make any money on this. I'd like to place before you what has been marked for identification as Marvel Exhibit 60. Is this a document that you wrote, Mr. Wolfman? Yes. Now, I noticed that in this document, you make note of the fact that neither you nor Mr. Colin got a screen credit in connection with the Japanese film. Is that correct? Yes, we did get a credit. I didn't ask you whether you got a credit. I asked you whether in this document you made note of the fact that you didn't get a credit. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes. You did not make note in this document of any other infringement or violation of any supposed rights that you and Mr. Colin had. Is that correct or not correct? I also didn't skywrite it when it happened. Am I correct or am I incorrect? Mr. Fleischer! Mr. Wolfman! You are asking a question that is pretty ridiculous here. Of course it's not in there. You can tell. But that's not a place... This letter was not a place that I would bring up legal material. This was a benefit letter to help Mr. Cullen raise money to save. I don't think there is a pending question, Mr. Wolfman. Do you want to continue giving a speech? I'll finish my answer. I don't think there is a pending question. Okay. During the course of the 1970s, you submitted stories and story ideas to Marvel. Is that correct? I submitted stories? I wrote stories, yes! Did you ever enter into a license agreement after submitting those stories and having them published in Marvel with a third party to permit them to use one of those characters or stories? Marvel never wanted to enter into a situation. They never requested to buy any rights other than the comic book rights. I didn't ask you that, Mr. Wolfman. I asked you if you entered into a license agreement with any third party with regard to any of materials published in Marvel. Oh, I'm sorry. I misunderstood your question. Did I enter into any third party? Yes. Would you give me an example? Janus. Rhymes with anus. <laughs> no, you didn't say that. <laughs> <laughs> Who did you license Janus to? I didn't get to the licensing stage. I announced I had worked out a deal with NBM Publishing, uh, which is the largest graphic novel publisher in this country, and I believe overseas, to do a Janus novel. I have to ask, was that true? Is that true? Were they really the biggest, uh, the largest graphic novel publisher in this country at one point? I think it was that semantic thing, and they had a lot of rights for, like, cool reprint stuff, and they would probably throw the cattle and shit in there, right? Because, like, wasn't that, there's some kind of, like... Yeah, they might have kind of transitioned from Catalan, like the, the book format kind of looked the same. I think they did some of that stuff, maybe yeah. picked up licenses. I don't know what Catalan's end was. My, but. my earliest knowledge of uh, NBM was um, before IDW did like the Primo, um, Terry and the Pirates, they did these black landscape books that were like some of the first I ever seen like that, man, where it did about 15, 20 volumes of that bigger like so like the um idw books have like three strips per page for per page had only two and had the title of the strips it was pretty sharply done i think bill blackbeard was involved like they were sharp as fuck when i start first started going to ides you would see that stuff man one of my early mbm memories is uh a friend of mine was doing porn comics for them yeah so it must have been like after fanographics eros line because this would have been like early 2000s and then like asked them how much it would pay for him to do like a non-porno book with them and it was the same <laughs> <laughs> and so uh he wanted to, to transition over to that side <laughs> oh man all right back to the uh back to the transcript fleischer is there any tangible evidence of this arrangement with, with janus yes it's in one of your exhibits the comics journal number 100 i believe it is any other prospective licenses no i think that may be the only one did you ever attempt to sell reprint rights to any of the stories Marvel had published that were authored by you? Uh, then I couldn't have done it. Have any of the characters you introduced into stories at Marvel been used by you in your DC Comics work? I, had, I adapted one of the characters into my DC Comics work. What is the name of that character? Terax. Uh, I turned him into a her and it became Terra. And 
I did Janus, or at least I had sold, made a deal to do it. I just never finished a graphic novel. But is the Terra character the same character? That's the same power. That's about the similarity. Does that make it the same character? Not completely. Did you ever use any of the characters that were published by Marvel in any publications at DC Comics or any other publisher? As I said, just Janus. Are you familiar with the publication called The Curse of Dracula? Yes, I am. And The Curse of Dracula was a publication for which you wrote the story? It's a book that I own, so I, yes, I wrote the stories, created the characters, and sold it. Did you ever use any of the vampire characters that appeared in the Tomb of Dracula series at Marvel for your own Curse of Dracula book? No, but I adapted. Is the answer no, Mr. Wolfman? The answer is I adapted one of the characters, so I didn't use a specific, specific character, but I adapted it. The characters that you used in Tomb of Dracula, Edith Harker and Quincy Harker, were they used in The Curse of Dracula? You want me to go through 60 characters? No, I'll tell you which one. Was Saint the Dog used? If you're going to go through it, no. Those are the characters that you claim appeared in the first issue that you wrote for Tomb of Dracula. Is that correct? I don't claim they appeared. They certainly did appear. Apart from your prospective license you said you had with respect to Janus and revamping of Terax into Terra, did you make any other use of any character that you had published by Marvel in any other aspect of your work or business? No. Mr. Wolfman, did you ever solicit John Byrne to collaborate with you on a project? Did I ever solicit? John drew some stories mm -hmm. that I wrote, yes. I asked him one or two times. Did you ever solicit John Byrne to work with you on a new story for a publication called Star Reach? No. Do you remember sharing an idea for a post-apocalyptic series in which Mr. Byrne would participate with you as the artist? I don't recall. I never worked for Star Reach, and I don't believe I was ever asked to work for Star Reach. I didn't ask you that, Mr. Wolfman. I asked if you proposed to Mr. Byrne that you and he collaborate on a project and offer it to Star Reach. And I said I don't recall. Now, you testified on direct that you learned that Malibu, or its imprint Eternity, intended to print your Love Witch story. Do you recall that? Yes. And I think you testified that story had originally been published by Skywald. Is that correct? Yes. Now, when you first went to Eternity, they told you that they believed they had the right to reprint the story. Isn't that correct? I told them that they did not. I told them. Mr. Wolfman, let's take it one step at a time. I asked them what they told you. I don't remember what they told me. I think they may have said that. Then I told them they did not. Mr. Wolfman, I just asked you one question, and the question was, did they tell you that they thought they had the right to reprint the Love Witch story? Gilberto. Your Honor, I would object to the bullying of the witness. The witness is trying to answer the question, and Mr. Fleischer is trying to bully him into some answer. Court overruled. Fleischer. Is the answer to the question yes or no? The answer is yes. I think you also said yesterday that you showed them or indicated to them that they didn't have the rights. What did you show them to indicate that they didn't have the rights? I showed them the fact that the magazine had never been copyrighted, uh, that there had been no protection for me, for my character, and that therefore they were buying material that they had no rights because the material had not been protected by Skywald and therefore was retained by me. Well, how did you show them that the original work had not been copyrighted? I think I told them that I didn't show them. Uh, they must have had the books because they were going to reprint them. Let me start over so it's easier for you to understand. You told Malibu that Skywald had not copyrighted the original Love Witch story when it was published? That was the only one. Uh, then I told them. I told them that I did not give them the rights to do it, and I did not sell them the rights to do it. Let's take this one step at a time. So you told them that it hadn't been copyrighted. I use that as further proof. And if it hadn't been copyrighted and had been published, wouldn't it be in the public domain? As far as I understood, because I had not sold them the rights to own the characters to, to reprint the stories, that it was retained by me. So apart from showing them that the story was in the public domain, how else did you persuade Malibu that you retained rights? As I just finished saying, I told them that I, was never, that I had never sold the material to Malibu, and as an ownership, I maintained the ownership of it. So it was just your word that you used? You didn't show them any tangible proof of any kind, is that correct? They accepted the, the fact that since there were no contracts for me to sign and that I never signed away that, yes, indeed, it was mine. Nobody did that, though. Mr. Wolfman, isn't it a fact that the $100 they paid you was just a nuisance payment to get rid of you? No, absolutely not. Uh, why else would they make sure that my copyright was in there? And why else? Uh, would they make me, would they ask me to work on other books for them? A nuisance payment would not have done that.
They got to print the story for $100, didn't they? Yes, with whatever minor royalties uh, that would come to me. Now, Mr. Wolfman, did there come a time when you became aware that Marvel was creating a new imprint called Epic? Wolfman agrees. And Epic was different than other Marvel publications or promised to be. Is that correct? The actual publications were not that different. Well, wasn't the distinguishing characteristic of Marvel's Epic line is that Marvel would entertain creator-owned work and published creator-owned work in Epic where it wouldn't do that in its regular line of comics? No, not at all. You never heard of that? What you, the way you just phrased that is just absolutely wrong. Did you ever propose to Tom Palmer that you and he submit a story called Future Love to Epic so that you two could own the rights to that story? I submitted a letter to Tom Palmer that said he, Jim Cullen, and I should do it, not just the two of us. And wasn't the whole premise of that solicitation of Mr. Palmer and Mr. Collin to publish a story in Epic that, unlike Marvel, you could keep your rights in Epic? No. In fact, if you look at the letter, where is it? You had it. You gave it to me minutes ago. Uh, it doesn't say that at all. It says that it allows us to own everything so that we can start selling it to other formats, which I could not do with Tomb of Dracula. Mr. Wolfman, I'd like to place before you what we marked for identification as Exhibit 56. Is Exhibit 56 a letter that you sent to Tom Palmer? Yes. Would you read the last paragraph, beginning with the words, now, to totally screw up everything? Okay, to explain that. I didn't ask you to explain it. I asked you to read it, Mr. Wolfman. Okay. And this is the transcript or whatever. Now, to totally screw everything up, Rick Marshall has had this, mag this new mag, Epic, in which creators own their stuff. I have a story Rick likes and suggests that Gene draw it. I would like to get you to ink and color it, and of course, you could co-own the stuff as well. My idea is an overall series under the tentative title Future Love. The story is about two lovers who are being hunted. You discover pre-birth on the dimension where people are hunted down with the express purpose of being sent to this universe as inmates. The lovers will grow up to be the lovers will grow up in the story, six pages, uh, will end as they make eye contact, uh, a lifetime and a universal way. Are you interested? I'll be checking with Gene. Uh, if both of you will do a series of these future love stories that we own, we can resell them later and possibly make more money. Please tell me. Now, during the course of your work at Marvel, you were paid by check, is that correct? Correct. And you were always paid by check for the writing that you did is that correct as opposed to the editing yes you were paid by check for the editing as well yes but as a payroll check yes the writing checks were separate were they not it was completely different all right how many checks would you say you received from marvel during the 1970s order of magnitude for writing a couple hundred maybe mr wolfman on your direct examination you testified that you had no recollection of ever seeing a legend on the back of a check you received for writing you did at marvel is that correct yes i don't recall at your deposition, you did recall. No, I did not. I said I recalled seeing them at DC. Let me see if I can refresh your recollection, Mr. Wolfman. I'm reading from Mr. Wolfman's deposition at page 72, line 19. Can you wait a minute? Excuse me, Mr. Wolfman. I don't think I placed... These are mine. These are not yours. My lawyers placed them. No, you did not place them. Dilberto, please do not grab the deposition from the witness. Fleischer. Your Honor, apparently Mr. Delberto has placed documents on the witness stand for the witness to refer to during my examination. I'd like to have them removed. Delberto, the witness has a deposition transcript, is all he has. The court, I will allow you to use them, Mr. Wolfman. Thank you. Fleischer, Mr. Wolfman, did you testify at line 19? Question, when do you recall seeing a printed or stapled legend on the Marvel check for the first time? Answer, mid-70s. Did you say that or did you not? Can I read it? I'm asking you a question. I'm not asking you to read it. Tell you what, I will read it, then I will answer it. If you want me to do it from memory, I will not do it. I'm asking you if you said that at your deposition, Mr. Wolfman. I'll know it if I read it. Why aren't you letting me? I'm asking if you remember saying it at your deposition. If you let me read it, I will tell you if I said it. Please stop badgering me. I will give you an answer if I can read it. Look me in the eye, Mr. Wolfman. Did you give that answer to that question? Wolfman Review's document. Yes or no? Yes, I did. And I said... Mr. Wolfman, thank you very much. Now, when you saw checks in the <laughs> mid-1970s and you noticed the legends, what did you notice about it legend says? It says here... 
I didn't ask you what it said, Mr. Wolfman, in your deposition. I asked you if you remembered what the legend said when you saw them in the mid-70s. Mr. Wolfman, would you put the book aside? No. Mr. Wolfman, what do you remember about the legends saying? I don't remember anything about the legends. So you received several hundred checks during the 1970s, and you remember nothing about the legends? I don't ever recall seeing one of them on my checks. Now, weren't check legends the topic of conversation among comic book creators in the early 70s, mid-70s? In the early 70s at DC. Is the answer to my question yes or no? In the early 70s at DC. Well, at DC, wasn't it the practice that DC would own everything that the freelancers submitted? The standard practice was that the editors told us that they did, and therefore we assumed that they did because it was a verbal contract. And didn't the legends on the back of the checks at DC confirm the arrangement? No, not according to what your question was, which is what the freelancers thought. Mr. Wolfman, think back. Did the legends on the checks that you saw at DC confirm the arrangement pursuant to which DC owned everything that the freelancers submitted? Which question, which question am I answering now? And let me ask uh, which one, and I will answer that question exactly. Am I answering the first one, which said... Was there a topic of conversation with the freelancers about this and what we understood? Or, or are you now, now asking, did it confirm? Which? Mr. Wolfman, what did the legend on the DC checks say? The legend on the DC check stated it owned all rights. And having seen that check, that legend on eight years you were at Marvel, whether or not the checks had the same legend at Marvel? No, because I never saw one on mine. Now, did you ever receive any pages of original artwork for work you had done at Marvel? Yes. And do you recall the name of any of the series that you received artwork from? Not at the moment, because it was a long time ago, and I'd sold most of it. I assumed the books I worked on, but I couldn't uh, tell you every single one. Is it fair to say that you received artwork from every one of the series that you worked on at Marvel, including Tomb of Dracula? No, it would, be, be, it would not be fair to say that. I received artwork on a lot of series. I'm not arguing that. And from whom did you receive those pages? I think it was some secretarial person. I have a vague memory, but it was somebody who was a staff person. And in connection with the dissemination of the original artwork, was there any paperwork that had to be signed before you could get possession of that physical artwork? What time period? After the, let's say up until the change in the copyright law about 1978, late 1978, there was a log book that all you had to do was write your name and the number uh, what pages you took. After that, Marvel had some invoice type thing that you signed. That invoice type thing that you referred to, did that say in effect the recipient of the artwork acknowledged that he retained no rights in any of the materials submitted for that work? I'd like to see it again. I don't remember that stuff. That's not something. I was a writer, so this was just sort of a gift that was being given out to the writers. It was really something to do with artists to get their artwork back, so I wasn't paying a lot of attention uh, to it as a writer. I just got my pages. Didn't the acknowledgement apply to you as a writer? If you show it to me, I don't remember that as I say. Uh, it wasn't something I paid a lot of attention to because this was when I was having a lot of fights with Mr. Shooter and planning on leaving. So I wasn't paying attention to that, but it was after 1978-79. Now I'd like to place before you what we've marked for identification as Marvel Exhibit 54. Exhibit 54 consists of... Oh yeah, okay. Yes, I do remember this. A number of pages. I believe there are six in all, each of which is entitled Artwork Release. Is that correct? Wolfman concurs. In each of the documents comprising Exhibit 54 are copies of artwork release forms that you signed. Is that correct? Yes. Two of them I'm amazed by, but yes, uh, they were after I left the company, so I can't imagine having done that. The artwork release, which is the first document in the page, relates to... The Amazing Spider-Man issue 194. Is that correct? Wolfman agrees. And was it your understanding that in signing this release, you were confirming that you retained no rights in any of the work that you did on The Amazing Spider-Man issue 194? No. Would you read the second paragraph of the artwork release aloud? Yes. Reading. Although the Marvel Comics group is transferring the rights in the Marvel artwork, it is acknowledged that the Marvel Comics group retains all other rights in and into the material, including copyright, trademarks, and other rights therein subsisting. And would you skip the next paragraph and just read the paragraph that begins, it is specifically understood? It is specifically understood that pursuant to the U.S. copyright law, only the copyright proprietor here, here, Marvel, uh, may license the copyright use of the artwork, including 
the right to publicly exhibit, exhibit the same. Uh, Morpho will be happy to consider granting dot dot dot. Hold it. I'm losing track here. Quote, Marvel will be happy to consider granting the author, artist, and assignee the right to publicly exhibit the artwork upon such person's written request. Now, is there a character that you lay claim to as a result of its appearance in issue 194, The Amazing Spider-Man? I may have to find it. The Black Cat was in Spider-Man 194. In addition to the artwork release form that you signed in order to get the artwork you received from issue 194, do you recall receiving, when you received the artwork, that it had a copyright stamp on it? I don't recall. Was Black Cat first introduced in issue 194? Yes, according to my chart. I'd like to show you what we've marked for identification as Exhibit 55C. If you will flip over, it's in the book. It's in the next one, Mr. Wolfman. There are three parts of, ex of Exhibit 55C consisting of the artwork. Do you see that? It's on the back page. It's on the last page, Mr. Wolfman. Yes, I see it. I see it. Is that a legend that you recall seeing on all of the original artwork that you received under the Artwork Return Program? I have to be honest. I looked at the front of the artwork. I didn't look at the back of the artwork, so no, I don't recall. Certainly not at this time. Since I did, I say get rid of most of the stuff. Now, how many pieces of original artwork would you say you received over the years at Marvel? Not, not many. Writers only got two pages on a book. Some didn't even get that, and they didn't give out artwork for that long. How many books did you do while you were at Marvel? I'd say several hundred books I wrote, uh, but that they didn't give back artwork for all of them. Do you remember when the artwork return program began? No, I don't. Not exactly. If I mentioned the year 1974, would that refresh your recollection? It wouldn't refresh my memory. It's possible. As I said, they were giving it out for a while. I'd like to turn your attention now, Mr. Wolfman, to your creation of the Blade character. You can close the book. When did Roy Thomas and you discuss the possibility of your becoming a writer on a regularly published Marvel comic book series? Late 1972, I think. What do you mean by late 72? Fall. Could it have been the late summer? It could have been as early as August, September someplace, October. In fact, at your deposition, you testified that it was the late summer, early fall. As I said, it could have been late August. And how long before the publication of the first issue you wrote is it that you began work on that issue? A couple months. I guess two months. I don't remember exactly at this point. Let me think. If I told you that the issue number seven of Tomb of Dracula was published on November 21st, 1972, would that refresh your recollection as to when you began working on it? That would probably be about the time he asked me to start thinking about it. Yeah, and start working on it. Well, when the comic book was published, you had already been working on it for some time, is that correct? Yes, I don't remember the lag time with those early issues. Do you remember how long you were employed at Warren in 1972? I believe it was about nine months. Did you read Mr. Dubai's, Mr. Dubai's testimony? Wolfman confirms this. Mr. Dubai recalled he believed you were only there for two months. Do you recall reading that in his testimony? Yes, I do recall it. He was wrong. Do you recall him being very specific? You arrived in July and were gone several months thereafter? Yes, and he was wrong. Had you ever seen the Tomb of Dracula book prior to being contacted by Mr. Thomas? As far as I remember, it had not come out. I was given scripts or plots. By Mr. Thomas? Wolfman agrees. So the answer to my question is that when Mr. Thomas first contacted you, you had never seen it before. Is that correct? I'm saying I don't recall if I had ever seen it before. In what form? At your deposition, you testified that you had never seen it before. Do you recall that? And that's what I said. Well, which is true? Had you seen it before or had you not seen it before? I think I said, let me check my deposition. Do you know where the number is? Mr. Wolfman, I'm not asking you to look at your deposition. I'm asking you what is true. I don't believe it had been published at that time. I think I saw it in script form or plot form. I could be wrong. It was a long time ago. It was not something of major importance to me. Do you recall being interviewed on the telephone in 1977 by Del Kutsera concerning the origin of Blade? Only because of my deposition do I recall that, yes. I've given hundreds and hundreds of interviews. Is the answer that you recall it or you don't recall it? I said because of the deposition, he talked to me. Uh, then I remembered I gave, him, I gave an interview with him. I did not recall that I had given one until then because most people just interview. I forgot who they are. They go on. If I see an interview, it comes out. Now, you have seen the article published in Cine Fantastic magazine. Is that correct? Yes, I did. And you were quoted in that article fairly extensively. Do you recall seeing quotation marks? I recall seeing quotation marks. They weren't always true, but I saw it. Were any of them true? Some. Does that refresh your recollection that the interview actually did take place? 
I said that based on the deposition and based on the fact that I was there, yes. I did not recall that someone named Dale Kutzera uh, interviewed me. Lots of people have. I'm not denying that it's there. Did you tell Mr. Kutzera that, quote, it was not necessarily the book referring to Tomb of Dracula that I wanted to be assigned to? I had never seen a vampire film, nor was I ever really interested in that type of material. That would be hilarious. Mr. Wolfman, the question is very simple. Did you tell Mr. Kutsera that statement, or did you not tell Mr. Kutsera that statement? I don't know why I would say something. Mr. Wolfman, I'm not asking you why you would say something or what day it is. I'm asking you if you said that to Mr. K Mr. Kutsera, or if you didn't say that to Mr. Kutsera. Mr. Fleischer, I've just gotten finished saying very clearly, I don't remember the interview. I've done hundreds of them. I can't, cannot tell you why I said that. Uh, why would I say that? Mr. Wolfman, I'm not interested in answering your questions. I'm interested in you answering mine. Fine. Do you recall being interviewed by Gary Groth of the Comics Journal about Spider-Woman and a variety of other topics in 1978? I remember the interview when I read it, yes. And do you recall saying in that interview in 1978 that you never read or saw horror movies, that you were queasy about horror, and you couldn't stand the sight of blood? Well, let's see. I cannot stand the sight of blood. Absolutely true. I'm not a big fan of horror movies. I've seen some. What was the other one? That you never read horror. No, I couldn't not. That's not true. Even if I said that, it was not true. Do you recall stating at the time that you never read vampire stories? That's not true either. I didn't ask you whether it was true or not. I'm asking if that is what you told the writer. I don't recall. I have to see the interview. I don't recall if that's what I said. First, Mr. Wolfman, let me ask you if you can identify Exhibit 50 as the interview that you gave to Mr. Groth in 1978 or at least as it was published in 1978. Without reading every, every line of this, this is what it says it is, so yes. And do you recall actually editing this article or interview before it was published? Editing an interview for Gary Groth does not mean, and in fact pretty much guarantees, it will not be used in terms of your edits. He does not really use the edits. I remember editing it, yes. Uh, I do not know if he ever used it. Gary had a tendency to assuage creators by letting them edit and then not putting in the edits. <laughs> Would you turn to page 51 of the article, which is the last page of the exhibit, Wolfman complies. There is a little box in the lower right-hand corner of the page that says a final note from Marv Wolfman. Do you see that? Wolfman concurs. And the second paragraph of that little box says, quote, I've just gone over the finished transcript. And it goes on. Mr. Wolfman, does that refresh your recollection that you actually saw the final version of this article before it was published? The transcript, I said that. Uh, I said I even edited it. Okay, now would you read for me, Mr. Wolfman? Well, let me read it for you. I'm reading from the portion at column left in the middle of the page attributed first to Thompson. Quote, I assume that when you took over Tomb of Dracula... Let me find that. Uh, where is this now? Yes, Thompson is saying, quote, I assume that when you took over Tomb of Dracula, you didn't expect to be doing it for seven years. And then Wolfman's answer from that issue of Comics Journal. Uh, put it this way. Uh, I took it over just because I didn't want to be fired from Marvel. I had never seen a Dracula movie. I do not read vampire stories. I have no love or care for vampires at all in the slightest. I don't write a vampire comic book. The only reason I took it over, I asked for Doctor Strange. I was on Captain Marvel at the time, and I did an incredibly bad issue of Captain Marvel. Do you remember saying that to Mr. Thompson? I don't remember saying that. Uh, it's there. I probably did. And Mr. Thompson goes on to say, God, yes, I remember. The art was... Hi this is Wolfman now from the interview. The art was hideous to begin with. And even the bad stories that I wrote, the artist didn't follow. The story was just appalling. My lack of ability at that particular time, that was seven years ago, was horrendous. How I even got it, I don't know. I was at a party and Roy was there, and I'd say, please take me off Captain Marvel. I don't know what to do with the stupid thing. I'm awful on it. He said, what do you want? I said, Doctor Strange. Gardner Fox was on Tomb of Dracula and Doctor Strange at the time, and Roy made the comment that he wanted to see what Gardner did on Doctor Strange, but if I liked Dracula. It goes on. As I said, I never read or saw horror movies. I don't see horror movies today. I can't stomach them. I'm very queasy about horror. I can't stand the sight of blood at all. Really, I'm very strange. I walked out of The Exorcist. In fact, I was the only one left to do a parody of it for crazy. I had to go see it again, and Len Wayne had to give me tranquilizers to sit through it because I felt nauseous during the whole thing. I really cannot see horror stuff. 
But I read the Stoker novel at that point when I was told that I would write Dracula, and I had no other choice. I fell in love with it, etc. Do you recall making those statements Mr. to Mr. Thompson? It sounds probably right. And do you recall making substantially the same statements to Mr. Kutsera in 1997 in his interview? As I said, I don't recall speaking with Mr. Kutsera personally. I knew I had never met Mr. Kutsera until the deposition, so I don't, I didn't know him. I did know Mr. Thompson, the, uh, the article that is in there. I think my question called for a yes or no answer. I know you do. That's my answer. The first issue of Tomb of Dracula you wrote was number seven. Is that correct? And Mr. Colin was the artist on that issue. Yes, he was, Jim. And when we introduce Gene Colin into the mixture, I think that uh, tickles the behind with a feather, man. We could we could put a wrap in this episode and uh, continue this contentious cross-examination uh, this time next week, man. How you feel about that? Yeah, that sounds good. I am surprised by some of the stuff in this in terms of how contentious it seems to be. It seems like, like the stuff about shouting at the witness. Like, wow. Yeah. Yes. They, they need, where were the all caps? That's what I'm saying, man. Like, uh, that little transcriber could have done a little better job put some stuff in brackets. Exclamation points. Let us know. Give uh, me some stage directions. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, like, like, I feel like we'd all be more of Wolfman in that situation where you just had your direct examination or whatever that part is called. And you know, the enemy is coming up to like jump on you. So you're ready for it. You're bristled. You're ready to go, man. And you're like, the energy is flowing. The adrenaline is up. A lot is at stake and you guys are going to get catty. Yeah. It surprises me that, um, I, I don't, again, I know nothing about law. I don't know what the court's responsible for, but it seems I was surprised whenever they talk about shouting in here because it didn't seem like things had gotten off the rails to right. that extent that early on. And uh, it surprises me that, it, that the, the court's not like saying, hey, you know, it, turn it down a couple of notches because I'm sure it's a tactic. You right. know, like you, you come in there, you're bracing yourself for like what's going to be a bad day. <laughs> and then this guy starts yelling at you. I I, I mean, what's which <laughs> you had those friends, right? You go to the crib. And they're loud as fuck with one another. Maybe I that's still shouting. Some of those friends. Maybe that's shouting to you, but it's not shouting to them. Or if you listen to that Steve Steve uh, Austin podcast, when he's like, not even asking a question, but he's like, "Oh yeah, so you would do like this and blah blah blah," and like super loud, and it sounds like he's screaming at the guy, but he's actually agreeing with the dude now a little bit more. Like I uh, feel like I chalk that up to his hearing loss. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, that, that 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 could be. But what I'm saying is. Maybe more of Wolfman. He ain't used to hearing loud, uh, passionate talk. Well, I I, I feel for him. Because, like I said, if that guy treated him civilly, this is going to be the worst day of his life. <laughs> yeah, this shit sucks so much, man. Ugh. Definitely would stink to be uh, caught up in this stuff. I'm friends with more of Wolfman on, um, on uh, Facebook. I think we're going to have to get that guy on the hook, man. Try to, try to get a shoot interview with him. Talk about... Talk about this crazy stuff. He might not remember this. It's kind of like an interview. He's done hundreds and hundreds of them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there is still a lot of testimony to go. And uh, there's a second part to this stuff, man. You know, Actually, you know what? There's not that much more to go. Considering that um, the Kirby's estate settled. Yeah. I kind of wonder, like, is this the big Marvel trial? You know, like, like in terms of setting a precedent for who owns what and, and all of that, I wonder if this is the one. I mean, I, I assume this goes to conclusion. Uh, you know, I don't think we'd be reading this or have access to it if it didn't. Right. And I just wonder, like, is this their highest profile case in terms of one that actually gets a verdict? Yeah, we will find out, man. We're not going to find out next week, though, because this is a this is a big set of testimony here. And furthermore... In issue 239 of Comics Journal, that's the second half of this bit. And it does have a wrap-up final thoughts portion with Marv Wolfman that we will not read verbatim because that's that's copywritten material and all that. You know, this is the public record. But we will unpack that and give give a fine give closure to the whole thing, man. So everybody's been setting us up for this thing. And it's people we respect. Shouts to Uncle Jeet here who say that this is the one to cover and it is ramping up. It... 
Yeah, it's uh, it's hard to imagine. Uh, you know, you think it it will escalate as it progresses. It feels like it's already about a nine or a ten. It does. It does, man. And I can't wait to get to the next part, man. Oop, I see they spelled Morbius incorrectly. Uh -oh. Ready to get out of here? <laughs> yeah. Okay, favors like, follow, subscribe to the YouTube channel. Hit the bell. We'll notify you when new vids are available. What's out there, Jim? Hulk Grand Design Monster Number 1 is out there in comic shops all over the world, at least as long as supplies last. So pick yours up if you haven't already and tell them to reserve Hulk Grand Design Madness Number 1. It'll be out at the end of April. And join me on Patreon.com slash Jim Rugg. Was there a legend on your check when you got paid? <laughs> Do you own Hulk Grand Design, Jim? Do you have something to say to the people out there? I think they own everything. <laughs> Red Room Trigger Warnings uh, is owned by me. And uh, the first issue is out on the stands. Uh, the second issue should be out shortly, if it's not out right at this very moment. Murder on the Dark Web for Fun and Profit is the name of the game in Red Room Comics. Going to be coming out on a monthly basis. Every issue completely self-contained, so you get a complete full story. Uh, you can read these comics before they hit paper at my Patreon, patreon.com slash edpiscor. Last year's uh, season of Red Room Comics was called the Anti-Social Network, and it is in a trade paperback that you guys are supporting in a big way, which I appreciate. And you can hit up my link tree in the description below this video to get to all those places. What else do we have out there, Jim? Subscribe to the Cartoonist Kayfabe newsletter at the links below this video. You can also find Cartoonist Kayfabe t-shirts and merchandise at the links below this video. That's another great way to support the Cartoonist Kayfabe channel. Jimmy, give them the marching orders. We'll be on our way. Read more comics. <laughs>